Hi, I'm Dr. Kiki. What could be more American than baseball? Well, possibly cars. And I'm at a Ford Media event at AT&T Park to talk about the future of cars, specifically how safe they're going to be in the future with the use of modern technologies. So come with me. I'm going to go check out a panel and do a few interviews to find out what lies in store. Where we see the intelligent car, the connected car going, in the future. We have a little bit different environment, high reg reg highly regulated environment, an environment that really requires some unique requirements to keep people focused on their primary function, which is to drive the vehicle. So this is a transparency that I think we're looking for. And where we see a, a reality of what success in this business and this capability is when the technology disappears into the background. And if you think about the car as being an ultimate mobile device platform, that brings up all kinds of interesting scenarios. With growth come practical problems. If we continue with the uh, uh, personal mobility model now in place today, the world's already overburdened transportation system will not be able to support it. Ford recognizes the need for smarter, more sustainable ways to move around big cities. And we are working to be a, a part of the solution by helping to build a more sustainable future transportation system based on an intelligent vehicle system. But how will it work? What is Ford working on right now? Ford's vehicle communication technology allows vehicles to talk wirelessly with one another using advanced Wi-Fi signals or dedicated short-range communications on a secure channel allocated by the Federal Communications Commission. As you'll experience in the demonstrations, 10 times per second, your vehicle will exchange information with all of the other equipped vehicles around it to identify potential hazards and warn the driver if necessary. This technology allows a, the full range of 360 degree detection of potentially dangerous situations, such as when another driver makes a mistake or when a driver's vision is obstructed. The first scenario we're going to show you is something called EEBL for emergency electronic brake lights. Mm -hmm. Imagine you're in a line of cars going down the road and maybe there's a big truck in front of you, but maybe three or four cars up ahead of him, there's a vehicle that has to hit the brakes really hard. You wouldn't really know about it until the truck reacted and you get into these chain reaction kind of crashes. But with this system, that vehicle up in front is going to send out a wireless message 10 times a second and one of those messages will say I'm braking really hard right now we'll receive that message and even before the car in front of us reacts we'll get a warning that something's about to happen imagine you're driving down the highway and imagine you're following that blue car but way up in front of him there's a black car that's broken down maybe he's stopped right in the lane and you can't really see that black car until the blue car moves out of the way and suddenly it's a panic situation but with this technology, the blue car and the black car are both equipped, so you'll be getting messages from that black car that says, hey, I'm stopped, and because the system will say, okay, he's in my path, um, you'll get a warning even before the bl blue car swerves out of the way. So we're driving along. Yellow. So even before, like, yeah, he reacted. We, we knew that there was a problem. The, the intersection crashes are the most common, are the most, not the most common crashes, but they're maybe about a third of all fatal crashes. Imagine this is an intersection. Imagine that truck is parked right there. And imagine you're, you're creeping out into that intersection, but you can't see anybody coming, but somebody's coming across from the right. So watch what happens. Uh, that that and, and it would work not only going forward but going backwards mm -hmm. you know so if you're reversing and, and coming out of your driveway and somebody was coming you'd get that same kind of a warning but this last one is maybe the most dramatic it's imagine you're coming up to that same intersection but you're just you got a green light and and everything looks okay as far as you can tell you're just cruising along but somebody is going to come through and violate the red light and meet you at the intersection but because that truck is there you can't see him 
So, um, you know, these are really bad crashes at intersections. So imagine what happens now when we, we pull up to that intersection, but the violator comes through. Three, two, one. So we're coming up, everything looks fine. So that's it. so that's why you know we get so interested in this technology because it's the only technology we know of that would really address that kind of a crash. You know, radars and cameras and lasers wouldn't really help you in that situation. But these wireless messages, uh, and if we can get you know all vehicles equipped, then we think we can really have a big breakthrough in safety. So Wi-Fi and GPS would ha would have to have a um, have a leg up over radar in situations like yeah, that I mean, you know, for some of the scenarios you know radar wouldn't help you like the one we just did at the intersection you know this technology is not perfect no technology is perfect like you need to have good GPS vi satellite visibility GPS are the satellites up in the sky that your car needs to see so if you're in a tunnel or you're in a big city where there's tall buildings you may have limited visibility to the sky and so um, it's not um, you know, we don't want to claim that it's going to address every possible scenario, but it really works like almost all the time. And NHTSA estimates that 81% of all the vehicle to vehicle crashes could be addressed with this technology. So that's a huge thing. And, and, and it's really low cost. Radar is a $1,200 option just for the forward looking radar. Here, our car already has GPS. It already has basic Wi-Fi. So just it, modifying it a little bit for this is really very inexpensive and can do even more than radar because radar can can only see what it can see. This this can kind of see a lot more, 360-degree coverage. Except, f so it, this would be car-to-car -car crashes, and like you said, we don't, uh, at this point, it wouldn't be involving pedestrians, bicycle riders. There are still um, those, I guess, uh, objects that have lower visibility that would not be covered by the Wi-Fi and GPS aspect. Yeah, I mean, we're hoping that, you know, um, people can start incorporating this in smartphones. So your next iPhone maybe would have this kind of capability as well. There's no reason why pedestrians or bicycle riders couldn't have the same capability. You know, maybe, you know, there's fixed objects, there's animals that, you know, you, you won't be able to address. But we think that this is really low cost and it's really bringing the same technology we use in other parts of our lives into the automobile, and we th we think it's it's the right way to go. Do you have any uh, d any data on uh, on the reaction times of people who hear the the distraction noise and how and how it actually works to improve their ability to react to things? Yeah, like I say, this this same driver interface is the one we have in production using a radar. Um, that same tone, and and we've tested it. We're going to be doing more testing, um, people, you know, different ages, different genders, to, to try to understand when to give warnings, and is this the right way to give all warnings, or maybe some should be done a different way. So we're not finished, but um, but that's um, but we think this is pretty good, and, and our experience so far with customers in production is that this works really well. From the um, the consumer and the user side, um, is this going to be something that? Uh, is going to you think change user behavior? You know, we we look at this system as like you know a vigilant passenger that's with you. So imagine that you know you're most people drive pretty well most of the time, but every once in a while people do things that they shouldn't and and they get themselves in trouble. So imagine that vigilant passenger is with you all the time that's able to to kind of say, hey, look out, you're about to run through a red light or a stop sign or or you're closing in on that car too quickly or something. The, the nice thing about this technology, it can even see what that a real human passenger couldn't see like we just saw at the intersection. So, But it, it's not really meant to, to give you a feeling of, I can just drive any way I want and the system will protect me. It's just meant to say, I'm gonna help you when you make a mistake. And this is just the beginning. Many people, like Tilo Kozlowski from Gartner Inc., are looking even further ahead to predict and develop the automotive landscape for consumers of the future. So Tilo, will you uh, tell me exactly what your interest is in the future of cars? Well, we have been looking into the future of vehicles, mobility and individual mobility in particular, for over a decade now. And one of the top topics that we're looking into is the connected car. 
as it relates to that. So the connected car means ultimately that consumers will have a different opinion about vehicles, that government agencies have to think differently about transportation, and that the car industry, maybe even other industries like consumer electronics, all have to figure out a new way to excite consumers with new services, new offerings, new value propositions. That's something that we are researching, that we're trying to predict how the future is changing, and it's something that I find personally also very exciting. I think it's a really interesting question as well, going from you know what technology we have available now and what is the technology of the future going to be, what are the needs or the desires of the consumer going to be 5, 10, 15 years from now? How do you address you know, the changes in technology and what you think might be that where the heart and mind of the consumer is going? That's a really you know, tough kind of a thing to do, as you can imagine, right? So we don't have a crystal ball that's not going to help us. So what we do is we're looking at consumers today, we're looking at technologies today, but also project into how can consumers maybe leverage technologies that don't even exist today in order to satisfy their needs that they have today versus that they will have tomorrow. And needs don't really change that much. It's technologies and it's the way consumers try to address those needs that are changing over time. Think about the car as a perfect example. We have had automobiles for a whole century now. They haven't really changed. We don't have an alternative and I don't think there will be an alternative to individual transportation that looks different from a car that we have today. However, there will be different functions in the vehicle that can satisfy that need. And who says that going forward you and I have to drive and steer the vehicle, the vehicle can do that for you. So we're really now entering a new phase where cars are becoming much more intelligent, where you as a consumer can focus on other things because let's face it, we're not the best drivers and a machine can do a much better job. So we're looking into those kind of needs predict where the technology is going, and also influence that with cultural changes, maybe even government, political um, considerations that you have to con uh, think about, and put this all together in order to predict where the future is going to be. It's an art, it's not easy to do, but we have a really, really good track record of doing that. One of the things I think is very interesting about technology currently is personalization. Uh, every, especially the younger generation, are very interested in being able to personalize whatever device they, they own. So the car of the future, is it going to be personalizable? I mean, currently they're very mass produced. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, that's going to be one of the challenges for the industry to figure out a way to get you that personalization effort and at the same time still make money in producing these cars, which means you have to have high volumes. Mm -hmm. But that's the beauty of software applications and maybe even to a certain extent hardware that you could swap over time. You replace your cell phone maybe every year, every two years. Consumers already do this uh, on a large scale. Yeah. If they could do the same thing with software or applications that they consume while driving in a car, that could be a new way to not only personalize, but to do this over time. So going forward, we may have much more options than getting different rims for your vehicle to personalize your car. You may do this based on what you actually want in terms of a data and information experience in the vehicle. Currently, cell phones, uh, as your example, uh, cell phones are really dictated by the service provider, you know, whether it's AT&T or Verizon or uh, T-Mobile, whatever you're choosing. Do you, believe, do you think that uh, the automotive industry is going to get into partnerships like that with service providers? Absolutely. I think the automotive industry has to get into these kind of partnerships because if they don't, they will probably not be able to predict and respond to some of these changes that we just talked about quickly enough. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, where do consumers go today if they want to get new computing technology or consumer electronic devices? They go to a retail outlet that focuses and specializes in this. The car industry has to leverage these kind of touch points and some car manufacturers already do that today with regards to providing infotainment uh, technologies and educating consumers on it or even electric vehicles. So you already see these kind of new partnerships forming and I personally believe that these kind of partnerships between consumer electronics, retail, and the automotive industry would be key to making all of this successful in the future. Do you think there's going to end up being a Google of cars? That's a fascinating question. I think there's a real threat for the automotive industry and maybe a real opportunity for consumers that brand new companies getting introduced into this stuff. And if the car industry doesn't do a good job exciting consumers with these new technologies in the vehicle, others like Google or other companies out there will actually follow that void and, and pro provide these kind of experiences. So yeah, there's a real threat to this. And I think the automotive industry has to be very careful not to lose track. So the opportunity in my eyes is to convince consumers that car industry and the car industry and the car companies can provide that excitement in a car going forward, not leave it up to the consumer electronic companies to do that. And what is your ideal car of the future? 
my ideal car of the future personally is still something that I can drive because I enjoy driving just for fun. But I realize I'm not, you know, the majority of people. The majority of people just look at a vehicle as a means of transportation. So I want to have a car that I can push the button and that drives itself when I don't feel like driving and stop and go traffic, for example, or maybe when I enjoy that nice wine with uh, somebody else. But for the other times, I want to be able to drive that car whenever I want. And it has to be affordable still. So hopefully we can still have that excitement from driving itself plus driving on my own mm -hmm. going forward. And it's going to be interesting to see how that will shake out. Do you think the technology is there? Absolutely. I think it's not so much the technology as a burden anymore. It's much more the cultural changes that need to occur. People actually getting comfortable with that idea. Legislation being able to actually accommodate these new technologies. If cars can drive themselves, maybe an eight-year-old can be driven by a car without any supervision. Or what if you had too many glasses of wine? Is it still okay to have that autonomous vehicle drive your home? Or do you still have to be somewhat cognitive available to actually take over if something happens? So I think the cultural changes may be more of a burden than the technology changes, which is pretty amazing if you think about it. Those are really thought-provoking ideas. So I'm going to go think about that. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. I've had a lot of fun today. I hope you have too. And I hope that you've learned a lot about the future of where these cars are going. 2013, we might see some of these cars on the road, Wi-Fi, GPS, souped up safety vehicles for more and more people. I'm Dr. Kiki, reporting for TWIT.